Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. So they, they grow up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. They, they, they don't even know what New York City is. They, they finally, you know, they end up in Princeton, New Jersey, then Harvard, Boston. Then they go to Wall Street Law Firm, and, and then they get involved with cases, trying cases in front of the Supreme Court, and, and really involved in truly trusting the state. I have the legendary Bill Zabel, who is the founding partner, head of the Individual Client Services Group at Schulte, Roth & Zabel. I'm so happy you're here today. Thank you very much, Mark. So, Pleased Bill, to be here. So tell me, you know, it, it's very interesting. Most people thought that the Russian Jews who came here came to New York, but your great-grandparents came... Mm they ended up in Galveston. Tell me the story. It's a, the Warburgs and the Schiffs were always helping people out. Tell the story. It's a very interesting story. Both sets of my grandparents landed in Galveston, Texas, thinking they were going to land in Ellis Island and see the Statue of Liberty and become Americans. But the, in the, between 1900 and 1904, there were several wealthy Jewish, German Jewish families in New York paid ship owners leaving from uh, from Hamburg mostly, to not land in Ellis Island, but to take their cargo, the German, Russian, uh, the Russian and Lithuanian and Polish Jews, not German Jews, to Galveston. So 200,000 Jews ended up in Galveston. They get off the boat looking for the Statue of Liberty, and I guess somebody says, you want some barbecue. Now, now you, what was interesting in Galveston is your, your father's side was the Russian right. side. And but my mother's side was German, but she, she got on the, they got on the wrong boat, so to speak. So your mother was, was the German side. Yeah. Now your father, you said to me, it was Zabelski? Zabel, Zabelski. Zabelski. Okay, so you, you, both people end up in Galveston. Where do your mother's parents go to now? They, they go, because of other relatives that earlier gone, to Omaha, Nebraska where my mother was born, where I was born. And, and your father's side? My father's side, for reasons I've never been totally clear on, end up in Rock Island, Illinois. And he grew up there. So he's in Rock Island, Illinois. Your mother, who was a beautiful woman, goes to the University of Nebraska. Yes. 
And when she's at University of Nebraska, she meets this guy who at that time was living where? Your father? He was living in Lincoln, Nebraska. He's, That's where the university okay, is. Okay, he was in Lincoln, Nebraska. Your father's side was involved with the scrap business yes. at that time. And now, your mother's side, you know, if they would have stayed in Omaha, some of the relatives meant, uh, met a guy uh, who, who did rather well in yeah, Omaha, rather Nebraska. Omaha Buffett. Buffett, okay. Uh, uh, so you're born in... Omaha. Omaha. And how does the family now go to South Dakota? My, my father and, and, my, and his brother-in-law, my mother's brother, had a disagreement over running a scrap iron business. And uh, they decided to part, keep it friendly by parting. And my father and mother and, and, and I, because I was five or so, moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And he started a scrap iron business there. Sioux Falls is the home of uh, the credit card processing for Citibank. Yeah. It was written up by Worth Magazine as uh, you know one of the best places to live. Tell me about growing up. It, in it, it was a wonderful city to grow up. We we call it the Queen City of the Upper North Middle West. Carefully defining th that area, and actually in, in the five state area when I grew up, Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. Sioux Falls was the largest city, even though it was about a hundred. 150,000. There was no prejudice. There was no crime. <laughs> essentially, it was a uh, far. It was it was a, not a very sophisticated city. I had a great childhood there. I had no anti-Semitism. Now you said when you were there, you know, you you, you worked one summer in the Dairy Queen. You were a debater, and also one thing that you did, you you worked, uh, you know, in the scrap iron business. Yeah. Uh, with your father and like in the James Bond well the, the he had one of these machines that takes an automobile and crushes it into a little box comes out a little box there's a James Bond movie where that happens but there's a body that's in the in, in the little square bleeding through the uh, iron and uh, I ran that machine so, so, and, and I also did some other work my family likes to joke about my brother and I being lousy drivers because we learned to drive with cars in the junkyard and there was no we could just crash uh, while we learned cause like bumper cars because no one cared and my father just said don't hurt yourself and so we we learned how to drive in a very uh, i guess irresponsible way so so while you're in sioux falls you know you, you you're a good student in high school and the, the furthest you had really traveled was chicago illinois at yeah. that time and you you know you said to me you applied to, you thought you applied to four colleges. Yes, I did. Okay, you, you, you applied to Harvard, Yale, Prince, and Prince. Princeton. And, and, North and, and you thought Northwestern. And I wanted to go to Northwestern. Because of I had gone to a high school debate institute there. That's how I had been to Chicago. And so what happens? Mom, uh, Mom, Mom's, Mom hid the facts? Mom says you'll be fine. I'm sure you'll get into all. And I said, I don't want to get into all. I want to get to Northwestern. She said, just show me you can get into these other. So I got admitted to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, and I don't hear from Northwestern. Mother says, I'm sure you'll get in, Billy. Uh, I'll call them. So she calls them, and she says, very sorry. They seem to have misplaced your application. They're not very efficient. You have to go to one of these other schools. I don't care which one. So the only person I knew in Sioux Falls who'd gone east to these schools was a congregational minister's son named Charles Gerlinger, I went and I talked to him. He said, go to Princeton. That's where he had gone. So without much knowledge and never having been to any of the three schools, I, I went to Princeton. So, so now this is, what, like 1952? 50, 54. 54. The 18-year-old the 18 kid ends up in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and th something happens at Princeton uh, w which has an effect later on in your life. The Emmett Tillings thing. Yes, uh, that the, the famous um, murder of a boy in Mississippi, Emmett Till, who whistled, allegedly whistled at a white woman, uh, was in the news then, and and uh, the, the killers were acquitted in about an hour by the jury. But my roommate and I started a petition to have the federal authorities prosecute them under some civil rights acts. And it got quite a bit of play because Einstein was among the signers of the petition, so the New, so the New York Times ran the story. That night, we got a knock on the door, my roommate and, and I at, at, at the dorm, 
And we opened the door, and there were three men with guns and white sheets with the Ku Klux Klan uh, apparel. And they said, you, you, I said, I won't use the words. They, if, you, if you keep helping these blacks, we're going to come back and really hurt you. Well, they made a big mistake because they forgot that all the laundry of the, of the students at Princeton was done by university laundry. So the university police looked at the laundry and found the sheets which, which had the eyes cut out because the three, the three fellows weren't very smart about that. Now, today, those three fellows would have been expelled. In, in those days, it was a little more lenient, uh, even though they should have. Now, now, one of them became, uh, so you kept the relationship yeah, later one on. One of them became a great liberal writer and uh, a proponent of progressive politics named Bill Greider. He was an editor of The Nation magazine. He wrote for Ro Rolling Stone. At our 25th reunion, he wrote a piece apologizing to us, saying the worst thing he ever did was posing as a Ku Klux Klan and trying to frighten uh, my roommates and me. He so you're, you're Princeton, and you said to me, one of the reasons you, you, you wanted to become an attorney was the dog and the poisoning. Tell me the story. My grandfather was a great guy, uh, very religious man. He had a white beard, even in Omaha. Uh, we had a dog, uh, and, and the neighbors, that purposely we, we we found out put poison where the dogs went this dog and he, the dog died and my 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 grandfather was so offended he found a lawyer and they took him to court and there was some c c legal way to find he couldn't put him in prison or anything but find a m malicious destruction of a dog and i thought you know that's a pretty good thing the law did he got some justice for my dog which i loved and uh, so it always stuck in my mind that maybe the law would be a, a thing I'd like. But then I also was a debater, and I think debaters tend to be troublesome. <laughs> if so, so now you're at Princeton, and you want to go to law school, and you decide, hey, you know what? I'm in New Jersey. Maybe I'll go to Massachusetts, right? Yeah, go to and, and you go to Harvard, okay? What happens at Harvard? So certain interesting things happen. Well, I, I, one thing that, that plays a part later in my life is I got interested in moot court in the laws that prohibited interracial marriage. And you could uh, not marry in America in, in most states, even up until the 60s. And I wrote a brief in the, in the, uh, in the moot court competition in a case involving miscegenation. And then I, I, they, I wrote an article in the Atlantic Monthly on miscegenation. So some years later, when I graduated law school, the ACLU asked me to write the brief in Loving versus Virginia, which is the case that threw out all the laws that prohibited interracial marriage and uh, made it a constitutional right to marry. Didn't you plead that case? I, was, I wrote the brief in the Supreme for, Court. For the Supreme Court yeah. case. It's uh, a great, I, I consider it one of my proudest accomplishments, maybe the proudest in the law. Right, but didn't you also get involved with a case which related to Medicaid? Uh, yes, I, I did. Uh, you, you've done a lot of homework. I, I represented two older ladies from New York. One was named Pulitzer and one was named Weiss. The Weiss was the mother of the founder, Paul Weiss, and they refused to sign the loyalty oath in, that they weren't communists in, in the Medicare. So we took, I took it for the ACLU again to court saying it was unconstitutional to require a loyalty oath to get Medicare. And the court decided very peremptorily that that was correct. And, you don't, and they kicked out the, the loyalty oath. Now, later on, so you graduate... 61. Um, in, in 1961, and you go to this law firm by the name of Cleary Gottlieb. Yes. And, and Cleary Gottlieb had a very interesting partner, Mr. Leo Gottlieb, who basically took you under his wing, right? Yes. Le Leo, and Leo was, uh, Leo was a German Jew. Yes. And, and, Leo, and a Harvard Law School. And a Harvard Jew. Law School graduate. And, and he really liked Bill Zabel. And, and he, <laughs> you know. I think he did. I liked him. Okay, it was a mutual admiration. But he introduced you to a world of people like the Lehmans, right? You, yeah. you worked on the, the, the first zoo. case he had me work on was the Children's Zoo in Central Park, named for the Lehman Children's Zoo. At that time, it's now the Tisch uh, Children's Zoo. But uh, 
I worked with all kinds of the Guggenheims. He, Leo Gottlieb represented most of the eminent German Jewish families in New York. He didn't. He didn't tell him about that being Zablonski no, with the no, no. with the Russian. I Jews. didn't think it was necessary, okay. and uh, he had the Guggenheims, the Lehmans, the Salomons, the Salomon brothers, a family, uh, and uh, we, we tended. Some people called the law firm clearly Gottlieb because he had so much clientele. Now, over there, you were in what department originally? In the trust in the states. Trust in the states and litigation and, and litigation. So. Because later on in your career, I mean, people know you as the preeminent trust in the states or individual client services that you've changed. But you've been involved, and we'll talk about it later on, in many major matrimonial matters, more as a mediator and to, to, to resolve these cases. Yes. Okay, as opposed to litigate these cases. Yes. So you're at Cleary Gottlieb for a number of years, and you, you meet some guys. And I'll call them the, the seven apostles or the seven <laughs> disciples. Uh, and it's like 1969, right? And what happens? Well, we form a new law firm. Now, who were these? You, the, the, the Schulte, they, Roth, and Zabel we know about, but there were, there there were four was, others. There was Goldstein, Shapiro, uh, Lehman, and McGoldrick. Okay. And, and you saw this law firm, and you know, you're what, 33 at this time? 32, 32. 32, 33, okay. And, you know, you had great expertise. And it's interesting, when you started the law firm, you didn't want it to be too ethnic, so you called it Bear and McGoldrick? Right. Tom Bear was the last one. Uh, right. Apostle. Okay, so the seven disciples, and, you, and your original office was in the Waldorf Astoria? Waldorf Astoria. How, how'd that happen? Well, we, need, we, we decided it somewhat spontaneously having and we the only space we could get temporarily was in the Waldorf we were there for about a year and then some funny th things happened at the Waldorf. Uh, one night Schulte and I had worked very late and we were coming down on the escalator and these two really lovely l ladies were riding on on the other side of the escalator and they said would you like to have a drink and we were it was midnight and we were talking and we thought she, we we're, were pretty good looking guys. We, they must want us to have a drink because of our physiques. It's, but then they, we got to the bar. We, they wanted to know how much money we had. Right. So, so you, you, you learned the other. We learned that well, our, it wasn't our looks. So, but now during, to, to build the, the T and E business, okay, you, you, you lectured a lot. A lot of PLI lectures, you yeah. spoke around, and, and through that you, you met some people because of your cases. I mean, that's how you got involved with George Soros yeah. from, from your lecturing and other but things, and the Rockefellers and other people over and there. The and uh, the lecturing was very heavy, and I, I went to University of Wisconsin, which had a, a famous uh, trust in the state summer session. I went to Miami Estate Planning Institute, which is sort of the the seminar for T and E lawyers, and I I lecture when anybody wanted to hear anything about. Any now, but as as we were talking about the cases, you know, later on, you know, because the secondary case that you you you, you know, which went to the Supreme Court, as you said to me, you know, Obama's parents had to get married in right, in Hawaii, in Hawaii, because it was interracial marriage over there. Okay. When did you get involved with this human rights organization? Well, the, You've been involved for like 30 years. With yes, in civil and human. I got involved heavily in civil rights by going as a volunteer lawyer in 65 to Mississippi. That was the famous summer when the Goodman and Schwerner right, were, were, were murdered. And uh, I went for the Lawyers' Constitutional Defense Committee. And in fact, I had the run-in with the real Ku Klux Klan that summer. Right, you know. uh, They attacked the... A, a core shack, the Congress of Racial Inequality, the, where we were helping some African Americans get registered to vote. Now, but this human rights organization that you've been the chairman of for how many years? Uh, since uh, I, about 15. <laughs> right, but you've been involved over there, and I mean, you met Dalai, uh, Dalai Lama over there. Yeah, that's, a, that's called Human Rights First. It was called Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. It's a great organization. It, for example, defends anyone seeking asylum for with without charge. We 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 figure we give about forty million dollars of free legal service. 
we defend Tibetan monks fleeing Chinese oppression, uh, pol political dissidents and from Russia when, when the Paris, before Perestroika, uh, political dissidents in any country. We actually defended a woman fleeing female circ circumcision, which was a hard case because the statute says you get asylum for fleeing political persecution, not cultural. And they argued that circumcision was a culture. We convinced the court that it was both things, and uh, we were able to get asylum for the, the woman fleeing. So how did th this world-renowned trust in the state's attorneys get involved with matrimonial? I mean, <laughs> that, that, you know, you, you represented uh, uh, the other side of Jack Welch over there. You've been involved Rupert with Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch. I, I mean, you, you, how did you get involved with the matrimonial? Uh, Howard stuff? Stern, I actually yes. I needed Howard Stern. Woody Johnson, my, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think exactly how. I, someone came, came to us uh, and said, would you do a matrimonial case? And we didn't really want to get into that area of the law. It's, it's, but I said I, I would mediate it. I think it was uh, an author whose name is, isn't important. And uh, if, they, if you're willing to mediate, you'll save a lot of money, you'll save a lot of angst and aggravation. And uh, they, 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 they did it, and I did it, and so then I started doing that. I take only four or five cases a year, always mediation, not litigation. So I, my wife didn't even like the idea that people would call me a divorce lawyer. She gets very annoyed when anyone does. Right, your, your wife over yeah, here, she, right. She's thir we've been married 35 years, and she says, you're not a divorce lawyer. Right. So, so uh, occasionally, on the Jack Welch case, we actually went to the... It's trite, but the courthouse footsteps you and resolved it and settled. Now, also, you, you've been involved with lots of charitable groups. I mean, you, you're involved with the Soros Foundations. You were also involved with a very interesting case. You were involved with the Pick Hour situation. Yes, yes, I was. Right, and, and Pick Hour was the the largest settlement paid to the Madoff estate. What happened over there? Well. Um, Jeffrey Pickauer was the largest, uh, he, his estate, he died during the process when he was being sued to, for a clawback, uh, paid $7.2 billion back to the government to use to pay, made up all the money he had taken out of, of, of um, he, was, he was legally liable only for $2.4 billion, but his wa wife, Barbara Pickauer, and, and uh, we, we advised her, wanted to pay it all back so there'd be no question because with his remaining assets, he created a, a foundation for charitable purposes, which Barbara is, is president of and, run, and runs. It was a very unusual, that whole Madoff thing is so unusual, but for him to make that kind of ass, 7.2 billion, it may be the largest individual settlement of a civil case in, in, the, in the law books. And you're still involved with the foundation? Yes, we re I re represent the foundation and Barbara. A and what work do you do with the Soros Foundation these days? Well, the Soros Foundations are, do are all over the world. They're called the Open Society Foundations. He has 32 of them, and we advise them when they have a legal pr problem. They, uh, he's, my, he's my good friend and uh, probably the most interesting uh, right. client. Uh, on, on the celebration of your, your 60th birthday, uh, I think uh, Mr. Soros and a couple of other people uh, came together. Uh, a really nice picture of you, uh, as opposed to your bow tie with your, your tie over here in, in Sioux Falls. Uh, and I, he, I wore a regular tie there? Yeah. yeah, you wore a regular tie. And he was one of the, the presenters over there with, uh, your, br with your late brother and, and your son. Yeah. Over there, so you, you, you've been involved with them. I number have three sons. Three sons, I know. A number of years ago, um, you, you decided to write this book, which has become like one of the Bibles of uh, trust in the state called The Rich Die Richer and You Can Too. Uh, now, you said to me that uh, th this is about close to 20 years ago? 1995. 1995, okay. So... Um, you know, this year, maybe in the 19th anniversary, you're thinking of writing a new one? Yes, I am. And, w and what's that going to... Well, there's several titles my publisher suggested. The Last Wife Wins. Uh, I, I think I will. I, 
write, write a new, new book. Uh, you were close to your dad, but your mother was really an instrumental person. She was very, <laughs> very... Yeah, you had this picture of you and mom over there. More recently. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the family genes are interesting because mom uh, was 91 when she yeah, passed. Yeah, yeah. And her mother, you said... Uh, it's 105. 105 over there. Talk to me about your three sons. Okay. I, have, I have three wonderful sons. I'm a very lucky man. Uh, the oldest, Richard, is deputy U.S. attorney of the Southern District now, of New York. Prior to that, he was a partner in a law firm. In right? a pr uh, Aiken Gump uh, law firm. Uh, we don't. We have a nepotism rule. Which has, no, no relatives. Yeah, no. which I'm not sure works very well with respect to my son. Uh, oh, he would really want to be on his own. And then my uh, my second son, David, is a television writer, and he's done very well. Right, you told me he had he some was good a, shows. He was for ER for some times, and then he had two shows on this season, but they were not renewed. We don't talk about that they were. And, and your third son? My third son's a businessman in, in the classic car business, Gregory, and he has a showroom in Beacon, New York, and... Uh, is an art dealer, in effect, in automobiles. So tell me about your lovely wife of 35 years. Your wife's name is? Deborah. And how did you meet Deborah? I met Deborah at a party that Paul Roth's sister and she were sorority sisters at the University of Pennsylvania. And, and let's talk a little bit about, the, as I said, the firm that was started by the Seven Disciples. That was 1969. This year you're going to be celebrating your 45th anniversary. Yes. We have 450 lawyers now. We have, we have offices in London, Washington, and New York, the major one in New York. Uh, we, we, we're noted for our, still for our hedge fund practice. Which is what you originally started. Which we did a lot of them. The, before P, other law firms would do it, I, I must say the individual client services department we're noted for it too. Uh, and it's, it's very collegial, even not with that size. But at the time we formed it, we said we would never be more than 30 lawyers. We'd try to be like a small U.S. attorney's office. Everyone would know everyone. Well, we just couldn't do that. Now, you know, we mentioned the three sons. Tell me about uh, how many grandchildren do you have? I have seven. <laughs> and, and the names of the seven grandchildren? You better uh, figure it out, Grandpa. Uh, my three oldest are Claire, Joseph, and, and Anna. Two of them are at Stanford and one's at St. Anne's in Brooklyn. I'm really blessed. Uh, Maggie and Charlotte are my two granddaughters with David in California. They're just seven and three. And Owen and Wyatt are my two youngest grandsons who live in New York. Would you, would you like the, uh, the grandkids to go into the le legal profession, do you think? You know, I, uh, years ago I would have said yes immediately to that. I have reservations now that I, we'd have to have another program. I, I wouldn't deter them from it, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't advocate it the way I, 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 I used to. It's become, uh, in some ways, too business-oriented, too much emphasis on p profitability and money. As opposed to the people. As being a profession and the people, right. So, uh, so I'd like to say, you know, it's fortunate that, you know, in Lincoln, Nebraska, mom and dad met. Yes. Good life in Sioux Falls, okay? Happy that you never ended up at Northwestern because you, <laughs> you might have not ended up at Princeton and Harvard. And I think what you've done for the community and civil rights and, and especially the trust in the state business, you've been a legendary person. I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me.